This is the first of three lectures on reproductive tactics and sexual selection in animals. The evolutionary goal of all animals is the same. It's basically to pass on as many copies of your genes as possible. So all of the behaviors that we've talked about in previous lectures about having to avoid predation, to find prey, to utilize habitat in an efficient manner, to forage optimally, all of these behaviors don't really mean anything if you don't pass on their genes. And again, usually you do this through direct reproduction, although in future lectures we'll learn how we can do this through what's called indirect fitness. And remember, fitness is a relative measure. Individuals of a species are basically in competition with each other to pass on more copies of their genes than other individuals. The individuals that are most successful at passing on copies of their genes or maximizing their fitness, these are the individuals that are more likely to influence the direction of evolution of their group. And this is the common goal of males and females. So let's look at what individuals of satin bowerbirds do to maximize their fitness. Let's look at it from the male's perspective first. Males spend virtually all of their time building and defending elaborate courtship displays called bowers. Here you can see a male facing a female who is actually in the center of the bower. The bower has this structure that has been produced uh, by the male, this stick structure, and then it has various decorations, the, the blues and the yellows that are spread throughout the bower. Females tend to visit lots of bowers and observe male behaviors before they decide who to mate with. And most females in a, a population will mate. The females are very picky, and they typically mate only once. In a few cases, they may mate multiple times, but very rarely more than two cases, as shown from the data here. Males, on the other hand, have a really hard time mating. A few males do most of the mating. A few males will mate numerous times, but most males mate very few times or not at all. And so there's a huge fitness advantage to individuals in the former category, those males that mate the greatest number of times. These are the individuals that are maximizing the fitness. All other individuals in the population have much lower relative fitness. And one of the central behaviors in this story, the bower, and the, the elaboration and decoration of the bower, has been a central part of the biology of bower birds of many species, and it's likely that bower construction evolved early in this group's evolution. And as you can see from the phylogeny on the right, basic bower design has been fairly consistent. You see the blue clade here is what is referred to as the maypole bowers. They have these poles with sticks around them and sometimes made into hut-like structures that serve as the centerpiece of the bower. The orange clade here is more what is called the avenue bower builders. And so there are some variation among the species in each of these clades, but there are basic architectural similarities that um, are the same within but differ across these two clades. However, within species, the more specific designs that are used to decorate the bowers do appear to evolve quickly, and females have a preference for greater elaboration and greater variation on a year-to-year -year basis. So from that example, it looks like males and females go about the mating game in very different ways. So the males in this case were developing the bowers. The females were checking out various bowers before deciding to mate. And this is fairly typical in the animal kingdom. Females and males have different tactics for reaching their evolutionary goal of maximizing fitness. And oftentimes we see that there can be conflicts in the tactics between the sexes. So why this difference? Well, this difference is due in part to the different reproductive potentials of males and females. And the most fundamental basis of this is anisogamy, or the fact that the gametes are of very different size and very different initial investment. And that can be demonstrated from this figure here. Uh, male gametes are very small, female gametes are very large. The male gametes, the sperm, very small, males can produce billions of these, and each one represents a very small investment in both nutrition and energy. Female gametes, the ova, 
are relatively large. And the, there's a lot of variation among species in that regard, but they're always much larger than the sperm. And therefore, females can produce many fewer numbers of these. Tens, in some cases, to thousands. And, and in uh, some organisms that broadcast uh, eggs, it can be hundreds of thousands uh, or millions. But those are kind of the uh, extremes. And typically, females are more limited in the numbers that they can produce. And each one that the female produces represents a relatively large investment in both nutrition and energy. All right, so how does this affect male and female reproductive tactics? Well, males have higher potential for increasing their reproductive success. They're typically not sperm limited. A single male can fertilize many females in a population. So the typical male tactic is to mate with as many females as possible to maximize the number of ova fertilized. Therefore, males are often less choosy when selecting a mate. They will attempt to mate with any female that's willing. Sperm is cheap. If courtship is a relatively quick process, they want to mate with as many females in as short a period of time as possible. The gametes are copious, rarely a limiting factor, so you're going to maximize your reproductive success by using these to fertilize as many ova as possible. So male reproductive success is often limited by the number of females mated. We can basically simplify this by saying males are going after quantity. And one of the things that could limit their ability to mate with more females is getting involved in a long-term commitment. And so while monogamy does exist in certain organisms, and Victorian English literature might uh, make you think that that is the most important mating system in the animal kingdom, it's relatively rare. It is seen in quite a few birds, and we're going to talk about why monogamy is, is so important in birds. But in most animals, monogamy is quite rare. Now let's contrast the male's tactic to the female tactic. Females are typically very choosy when picking a mate. And this is because eggs are very costly, and they have a limited supply of eggs. And female, therefore, are, are kind of limited in the number of young that they can produce. And so their reproductive success is primarily driven by the quality of the offspring they produce. Therefore, females want to mate with only males of the highest quality. The highest quality males tend to be associated with the best genes, potentially the best resources, the potential best defense of the female and her young, and in some cases, the highest quality males may provide the best parental care. All of these things give the individual offspring, the few that the female can produce, the best chance of survival and subsequent reproduction. And it's often of little advantage to females to mate with multiple males. One of the topics we're going to investigate is why high quality males are the ones that show these very elaborate, exaggerated traits and how these are honest signals of the genetic or resource quality associated with the males and how females can use these as honest signals to choose appropriate mates. So this brings up the, the topic of sexual selection. Sexual selection is a special category of natural selection that leads to the evolution of traits that are not driven by their survival value, but traits that evolve for the sole purpose of increasing mating success. So males develop ornaments and weapons and elaborate displays. We'll talk about the context in which these can increase the reproductive success of males. One of the characteristics of sexually selected traits is oftentimes they actually reduce the survival probability of the bearer of this trait. And this theory was first developed by Charles Darwin. And we can generally break up sexually selected traits into two categories, intrasexual and intersexual selection. And in general, intrasexual selection deals with what we call male-male competition traits. And intersexual traits are those that males possess to convince females to mate with them and not other individuals. And so we call these female choice traits. So in review, Males and females have the same evolutionary goal to maximize fitness. But males and females have different general tactics to achieve their goals. 
For males, basically quantity is going to be the typical uh, way to maximize your fitness. Sperm is cheap, so short-term commitments to matings are key to maximizing the number of females that you can meet and mate. From the female perspective, the quality of the mate is key. Ova are limited, and so the, the number of offspring that can be produced may be limited by females. And the more this is the case, the more quality is going to be the key to determining the fitness differences between different females. Females want to be sure to get the best genes and the best resources for their young. So sexual selection is the category of evolution that leads to the evolution of traits whose sole purpose is increasing mating success. We'll see that this involves combat displays and combat weaponry that males use in contests and sometimes indirect competition between males. But then other traits evolve to sway female choice. Elaborate male traits can help differentiate which male a female should mate with. And as we indicated, often these sexually selected traits are ecologically costly traits that wouldn't evolve through regular natural selection. And the categories that we're going to be investigating are intrasexual, which is typically male-male competition traits, and intersexual, which are typically female choice traits.